Hello, you're watching Eye on Africa. I'm James Creedon. These are our headlines uh, this Friday evening. The Ethiopian government has denied accusations it planned to choke off food aid to the war-torn Tigray region uh, after rebels took control earlier this week. We'll hear more from our correspondent in Addis Ababa. Zambia holds a state memorial service for its first president, Kenneth Kanda. He uh, passed away at 97 years old last month. Uh, more on how he was remembered today, coming up. And the international network Cartooning for Peace is organising a series of exhibitions and workshops here in Paris to celebrate cartoonists and artists from Africa. We'll have more details on that a little later on in the show. Thank you for watching. Now we start in the Tigray region of Ethiopia where the, the rebel Tigray Defence Forces took control of the regional capital, Mekele, earlier this week. A major blow to Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's attempts to snuff out that rebellion since he sent troops into Tigray last November. Now, humanitarian groups are concerned for civilians caught up in the unrest. Over 90% of the population is in need of food aid due to the conflict, according to the World Food Programme. And now some NGOs are accusing the government of cutting off humanitarian aid, in particular with the destruction of two key bridges leading into the region. These are charges that Addis Ababa flatly denies. Here's more from France 24's Maria Gert Nicolescu in the Ethiopian capital. The destruction of the Tekeze Bridge on Thursday has completely blocked one of the main supply routes for humanitarian aid between the Amhara region and the north of Tigray. According to the UN, Amhara special forces are behind this attack, but the government has accused Tigrayan forces. The unilateral ceasefire declared by the Ethiopian government on June 28th had raised hopes for an improvement of humanitarian access to the region, but for now the situation seems extremely critical as all entry routes into Tigray have been completely closed. The World Food Programme said on Friday that humanitarian flights have also not been granted permission for over 10 days. Stocks of food supplies are nearly exhausted, especially in northwestern Tigray, although loaded trucks are ready, waiting to access the region where several hundred thousand people are facing famine, according to the UN. Telecommunications and electricity supplies have also been completely shut down for the past days and banks are completely closed. The Ethiopian Minister of Foreign Affairs has denied that the government is trying to suffocate Tigray's population, saying that it has no reason whatsoever to do so. Now, Kenneth Kaunda, known as KK to his admirers, was one of the last founding fathers of African independence movements dating from the 1960s. He fought for Zambia's liberation from British colonialism and he also hosted freedom fighters from across the continent. Now, the Zambian nation and African leaders are paying tribute to the late hero. He passed away last month at the age of 97. After days of national mourning, a special memorial was held in the capital, Lusaka. Shirley Sitbon has more on the man some called Africa's Gandhi. Air Force jets, 21 gun salutes, late President Kenneth Kaunda, widely considered Zambia's national liberation hero, received all the military honors and more. People in the crowd, whose number was limited due to COVID, showed their personal attachment to the nation's first president by waving white handkerchiefs. That was Kenneth Kaunda's trademark symbol to the man who fought colonialism in a non-violent way. This represented peace and love. The presidents of South Africa, Malawi, Namibia, Mozambique, Ghana, Zimbabwe and Botswana came to pay their respects because Kenneth Kaunda was also an African hero. Decades ago, he rose up and helped their countries beat oppression. We will never be able to pay the debt that we owe you. And all we can say is thank you, thank you, thank you for all you have done for us to be a free people today. With President Kaunda's many battles in mind, Criticism regarding autocratic actions carried out towards the end of his 27 years in power seems to have faded away. Zambia mourns its hero, due to be buried on Wednesday.
Former South African President Jacob Zuma has asked the country's top court to rescind its decision to sentence him to 15 months in jail. Now, that decision handed down for Zuma not showing up at a graft inquiry. Uh, he was summoned to appear before. Uh, with two days to go before the expiry of a deadline for him to surrender to police, Zuma filed those papers, pleading with the court to reconsider its decision. Now, as things stand, if the 79-year-old doesn't turn himself in by Sunday, police will be given a further three days to arrest him and take him to jail to start his sentence. We'll be following that story as it develops here on France 24. Now, relative calm has been restored to Eswatini, formerly known as Swaziland, this after days of pro-democracy protests. Those protests were the largest seen in years in Africa's last absolute monarchy. Opposition groups and activists say dozens were killed by security forces in clashes this week. Troops are now patrolling the streets of the capital after scenes of looting and torching of buildings and widespread defiance of a nighttime curfew. Now, tensions had been building for months amid long-standing criticism of the decadent lifestyles of the monarch and his inner circle, while most of the rest of the country lives in poverty. Now, international network group Cartooning for Peace is organising a series of exhibitions, workshops and roundtable events here in Paris to celebrate cartoonists and artists from the African continent. The Institut de France and the Forum des Images have joined forces uh, to showcase 12 of Africa's most emblematic artists whose work is closely tied to the principle of freedom of speech. And uh, one such artist featured in this, in this report is Lassan Sahore. Uh, let's take a look. All it takes is a piece of paper, a few strokes of his pen, and Lassan Sahore tells a story. It's Laurent Gbagbo, who is running out of patience. It's the 8th, and he's wishing the days away to the 17th when he gets home. Once a self-imposed daily routine, drawing has become an unescapable need for the editor-in-chief. To be honest, when I'm not drawing, I get really frustrated. Zohore has been a caricaturist for over 30 years. Biche, the paper he created 22 years ago, is seen as the leader of caricature storytelling in the country. From challenging beginnings to national recognition, Biche's journey is that of a fight for free speech and insolence. At the beginning, when we started Biche, we were published in the governmental journal, so we would have to be a bit more subtle. A sense of humour and thick skin, those traits run deep in Côte d'Ivoire. But caricaturing remains a somewhat dangerous trade. During the 2000s military coup, La Sanzore barely escaped being taken into custody by the army. That day, I had to go to the newsroom. People living there told me, don't go, the army is doing rounds in the neighborhood. 22 years, Bish bore witness to multiple murderous crises that have left Ivory Coast scarred. For Zohore, a caricaturist's mission is to raise awareness, but not to add insult to injury. When the country is divided, when we feel a certain tension in the population, we try to be peacemakers. But when we feel that the mood is good, we just enjoy ourselves. We hit the left, the right, we hit whoever we want. I think we can be a dove of peace as much as disruptors. In fact, half angels, half devil, that's who we are. Angel or evil, one thing is certain. Zohre and his team will keep on marking Ivorian society and its politicians for a little while longer. And that exhibition kicking off uh, on Saturday uh, at the Forum des Halles here in Paris. Now, finally, we head to the city of Lag Lagos and the dreams of a young boxer there. He's one of Nigeria's brightest young talents in the sport. Yet training conditions are far from ideal, as you'll see in this report by Nicolas Germain. Tijani Abdulaziz is one of Nigeria's most promising young boxers. The 15-year-old lives in Alagbado, a poor district of Lagos. He started the sport at a very young age. I started boxing at the age of two years. My dad introduced me to boxing, and I loved the way he introduced me to that. The first technique he taught, he taught me was that, he taught me how to block, how to guide, and how to stand on my boxing position. That's how I started boxing. The local club doesn't have an indoor boxing gym, so everyone practices outdoors. The club was created by Tijani's father, who says boxing is helping the local youth. 
some children, they used to play with uh, something, or they used to play with dangerous something. They will just look at this dangerous something that they are doing, uh, what is going to comply with the dangerous something, and they will introduce sports together with it, so that they will be maintaining it and to not be using it at last. In another district of Lagos, a tournament has been organized, and once again, Tijani wins the trophy. My dream for this boxing is that I want to become a professional fighter. I'm an international fighter like Anthony Joshua, like Tyson, Tyson Vuri, and I want to represent Nigeria. In his sitting room, many trophies are already on display. His photo book recounts his past accomplishments. Tijani now hopes to be spotted by a scout and says he's ready to live abroad if that's what he has to do to become a great boxing champion. All right, that's all for this edition of Iron Africa. Thank you for watching. Do stay tuned. More news coming up.